Let's begin with a question. What do these images, these people, all have in common with each other? We have a general. He orders his employees, his soldiers, if they volunteer, or slaves, if they are conscripted, to kill, to suffer, and to die. Judges and juries, some of whom who are willing and some who are not, participate in sentencing others to torture and death. Cops and criminals also decide who will be tortured and who will be left alone. So you wouldn't be blamed to wonder why this category of people, parents, would be included here. After all, we accept that juries have to impose a sentence as a matter of utility. But what about breeders? They impose life and with it torture and death, but no one calls it a necessary evil. In fact, it's never seen as evil at all, despite the fact that it is completely unnecessary. Because we live in a natalist nation, where imposing harm, torture, misery, and death is protested by judicial and anti-war activists, and yet the same catastrophes that are imposed by parents are given no protestations at all. The difference between parents and a general is that his soldiers might make it out alive. They may come out completely unscathed. There's at least a chance. But not so with them. They know for certain that their creation will die and that it won't be pretty. They know this as a certainty. But they don't know how their victim will die. And I'm sure you, the majority in this natalist nation who are parents, might recoil at me calling your children your victims. But who else can we blame for your child's suffering and death but you? And you committed this act of aggression against someone else because of institutionalized natalism. Natalism is the philosophical position which claims that procreation is good or ethical. It's something to be celebrated. So obviously my position is the opposite of that. Anti-natalism is the position that procreation is always bad and is always unethical. Natalism has been the dominant position for so long and is so culturally ingrained in us by our parents, by our institutions such as Christianity, by our employers, by our television programs and advertisements, that most parents don't give any thought at all to the fact that someday their child will die. They comfort themselves with the thought that, well, I myself will be dead, so I won't have to see it. So that's why they get so emotional on the news when their child gets run over by a car. They like to say things like, I feel lost without my baby. <laughs> I miss her. She was so good. Nice. This didn't deserve to happen. No mother should bury their daughter. No mother should have to bury a child. No grandparent should have to bury a child. Alex was found dead in his bed after overdosing on fentanyl. No parent should ever bury their child. It doesn't matter what disease they have. It's the wrong order of things. No father should be burying their son at this tender age. Children are supposed to bury their parents, not vice versa. But we would not bury just one child. We would bury two. That just means that they are passing the responsibility onto someone else. Because somebody is going to have to bury their child. And they expect their grandchildren to do that. So that's why they will encourage their children to have children. The buck just keeps getting passed from victim to victim, over and over again, generation after generation. My parents forced me into a world that is seemingly backwards. I am obligated to celebrate and offer congratulations when someone decides not to use birth control, and I am told to weep and be sad when the suffering of that person is finally over when they die. It makes much more sense to celebrate an end to their pain and mourn when it begins, when they are born. What makes you parents think that there will even be jobs in the future? Are you going to employ your children or make sure that their needs are met? Of course you're not going to do that. It's their problem, not yours. The majority of parents don't provide any kind of parachute for their children. Because the welfare of their children is not their first priority. Their main obligation is to themselves and to their own pleasure and comfort. That is why when their child dies, they selfishly complain about their own pains, not that of their offspring. If they really were concerned about the welfare of their children, then they would do what antinatalists do. 
not procreate, and let the unborn stay in peaceful non-existence. The important fact that parents won't admit to themselves is that the world is a terrible place. This isn't a world without racism, sexism, violence, deprivation, and pain. It's a world full of those things. It's on the news every single day. Natalist Nation, I would like to draw your attention to this word, antinatalism. It used to be hyphenated, but that's been left behind as the word came into its own and became more widely used. As of yet, it's not in any dictionary, but a dedicated group of activists are working on that. An antinatalist is what the word implies, a person who believes that carrying a pregnancy to full term is unethical. It follows that most antinatalists do not have children, but not all. Author Jim Crawford, who wrote The Confessions of an Antinatalist, is a father of two. One can be a parent and an antinatalist so long as one admits that they made a terrible mistake. My own parents admitted that creating my brother was a tragic mistake as his life became a total disaster. The point is that you, listener, don't end up like my parents and don't create any more disasters. The term in its modern use was coined by South African philosopher David Benatar in his 2007 book, Better Never to Have Been. It provided a solid foundation on which to build an anti-procreation movement around. There have been others in the past who shared a similar philosophy, like Arthur Schopenhauer. But much like veganism, it didn't really coalesce into a distinct social movement until the 20th and 21st centuries. Now some of you natalists might be thinking, but isn't it natural to have children? Yes, it is. But who, besides those struck with religious delusions, say that nature is good? A common misconception is that animals have babies on purpose. All animals are driven to have sex, not to produce copies of themselves. Our DNA is playing a game with us. So that means that human beings are the only animals who replicate their DNA on purpose. Many animals that go unseen in our day-to-day -day hustle and bustle are suffering in agony at this moment. But unlike us, they cannot ask for help. This is the reality of life on Earth. It's addictive, it's cruel, and thankfully it ends, eventually, but not before the world takes its pound of flesh from us. Just because our parents made a fateful decision without really thinking it through. Would you send a soldier to his or her death if there was no war to fight? What if you decided that someone else had to die because you received some kind of personal pleasure from it? Would you consider that to be ethical? That is essentially what natalists are doing. They are sacrificing someone else for their own glory. Some say that what parents are doing is creating a Frankenstein experiment that they have no control over. What Dr. Frankenstein was doing was playing God. This is something that we chastise doctors for doing. We don't praise them for their megalomania. Christian groups are horrified that scientists can clone an animal, yet they are perfectly fine if we use our genitals to accomplish the same thing. You see, the deeper you dig into natalism, the more you uncover that this philosophy has no logical or factual basis. Natalism is a house of cards, built from selfish wants and desires, traditions and counterfactual beliefs in fictional, loving gods, and nonsensical life-after-death delusions. They do this despite the evidence that all of life's victories and cherished, beautiful moments are like the light of the stars against the overwhelming emptiness of the black interstellar void. They are tiny, brief, inconsequential portages over a raging river of pain and suffering. And parents have children before they've even come close to actually living their full lives. They haven't had the cancer yet, or the COPD, or the fractures, or the depression, the drug addiction, the loss of beloved companions. And even if a potential parent never goes through those trials, they have no guarantee that their children and their children's children will not. Every single parent is forcing their offspring to play a game of Russian roulette. Spin the wheel of misfortune and see what you get is essentially their model that they live by. This is ethically problematic to say the least. So before you're so quick to wish congratulations upon an expecting mother or father, think twice, because that person is about to send an unwilling, unconsenting soldier out into battle in a war called survival, and they could have just adopted a homeless animal or child that is already here instead.